Well, here's our new setup. We've uh, we've used the Pi and this HCSRO4 ultrasonic uh, module to do things like measure speed, measure distance. Theoretically, with that same information, we can measure acceleration. And the easiest acceleration, of course, is gravity. So I've rigged this switch down here, which you can probably just barely see over here. Maybe I can move it. There we go. So you can see this switch. And what happens is when I drop something, the switch will trigger and it will make three readings and I will get distance and time uh, over those three readings and theoretically I can calculate the acceleration of gravity. So let's go see uh, if theory works out in reality. Let's do a bit of a walkabout on the hardware components. We've got the ultrasonic distance measuring device like last time. The uh, rightmost pin, as we look at it this way, is the ground. The next is the echo, which uh, requires a voltage divider. This yellow wire goes back to as the input to the Pi. The blue wire is the next wire, pin 3 from the right, and it is uh, what triggers the pulses from the, uh, from the Pi. So the Pi triggers the pulses from the ultrasonic uh, distance measuring device. And the red wire is the 5 volt power supply. And the reason we need a voltage divider here is to ensure that we do not send the 5 volts back to the Pi. The Pi does not like anything over 3 volts on its inputs. So, the interesting new thing here is this switch. And what happens is, uh, I can put something underneath this switch, and when I release it, it will trigger the set of pulses that will measure the time as it falls away and hence the, the distance and the speed and theoretically the acceleration. These red clips over here, it's another voltage divider and what happens is when it's up pin 7 is connected to power and as it falls away pin 7 is interrupted and that triggers the series of measurements. Okay, so that's it. I'll put a description a diagram at the end of the video so you can see in more detail. But that's pretty much it. This piece over here is what we've been using in the past, and the only thing new is this triggering switch. So let's see how this works. I got this set. You can see on the screen it's a waiting measurement. And when I drop this, We look and we see accelerations that are insane. So these are the last two acceleration calculations, and they're just absolutely crazy. Well, let's uh, let's remove the pillow and let's just take a shot of the floor because the floor should give us a zero acceleration, uh, a zero velocity, and it should give us a fixed distance so we can see if uh, if the calculations are working correctly. So here we trigger the, the measurement, we're awaiting measurement, and here we've got nothing down there. I'll just let go of the switch with my finger, get my fingers out of the way, and there's the reading. Let's take a look at the reading. And as we can see up here, the distance is 48, 48, 48, uh, 48, 269, 48, 297, 48, 265. Yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, there's all 49, right? It's a low 49 point something. Okay, and the first velocity is zero. The second velocity is 8.5, call it. And the next velocity is minus nine. On the average, there's zero, but, well, that's part of the problem. We're not averaging. We don't have time to average. So let's take a look at this and see what's, uh, what's going wrong. This is going to take quite a bit of explaining today, so bear with me. Uh, here are the readings we last got, and you'll notice our accelerations are really bad. I mean, they're like, you know, really, really way too fast and really, really, you know, negative and silly things like this. Our velocities, uh, notice here, because we'll go talk about how we got them. Our velocities over here, zero is, well, that's reasonable because it wasn't moving. 8 and 9, again, if you average those, that's roughly zero, but again, when you're measuring acceleration, you don't have time to take a lot of averaging because the object is continuing to move away from you. So here's a first indication that something's going wrong. Uh, 
that things are popping in and out. On the average they're okay, but in reality each individual reading is not so great. The distance readings are not bad, 48.27 call it, 48.3, 48. Uh, call it, yeah, 227 again. So, once again, on the average, the reading's pretty good, but you notice that it goes up from here and then it goes back down. So, we're getting a distance reading that's going up and down, which is a problem. Um, let's go up here and look at this. These are some, uh, what would you call it, debug statements, I guess, I put in the code. And what this tells me is the difference between like start and end times on the measurements. And these should all be very consistent. But as we see, it's 1.911, 1.912, 1 1.911, okay, 91, yeah. So our readings are popping around all over the place. Uh, okay, well, let's go look at the code, and I can show you what I've done to try to minimize this, but it looks like still without success. Maybe somebody sitting out there knows something that I'm missing, can see something I'm missing, made some, I made some stupid mistake somewhere. Good, if that's true, leave it a comment and then I'll redo this. But as far as I can tell, this is about as good as I can get it. Let's look at the code over here on this side. Uh, standard stuff, these are the comments uh, on how things were done. Uh, calling in the libraries and all that. won't go into detail because we've done this many times before. Uh, GPIO. I've hard-coded everything I can possibly hard-code. So like pin 11, pin 13, I didn't use variables. I just hard-coded them. Uh, because Python's an interpreter. It's slow to begin with. And I'm trying to remove any slowness out of the, out of the uh, program, out of the execution to squeeze out some of the error times. Error in times. Uh, GPIO7 is the pin that was on the switch that's going to trigger when that thing falls, it's going to initiate. Uh, 11 is the trigger on the module and 13 is once again the input pin from the module telling us that the ping has come back. Bunch of variables I need for calculations. I'm going to keep the pulse start time, so pulse S is start time and pulse E is end time and I've got three sets of those, one, two, and three. Then I'm going to keep the total time because the clock time, the wall time if you will, is not the same as these things. This is the start and end on when the sonic pulse went out and this is the real time in the real world. So you say, but these are real time in the real world. Yes they are, but only for the ping. I need the total time from when the object started to fall and that's what these things are. Then I've got my acceleration variables which uh, I'll show you in a minute, a bit. And then I've got my velocities, so I calculate the velocity, and then I've got some variables I just use for odds and ends. I've got a distance error in case the thing is just out of range, it's too close or too far from the sensor, then I just flag it for being no good. So let's get to the nitty gritty. Here's the main. Uh, this program runs in one shot, so I've done the simplest, fastest thing I can possibly do. I don't do any loops that are unnecessary unless I want timing, nothing like that. So, first of all, I'm going to begin with the uh, GPIO output pin 11, uh, false. So I'm going to get ready to trigger the, the pulse. And then I'm going to print a waiting measurement. So it's, we saw that on the screen, it's just sitting there waiting for the object to drop or that switch to open up. And it will sit in this loop until that happens. So it prints this one time and then it just sits and it loops until input 7 is 0 and input 7 again is that switch so when the switch is broken the rest of the program executes so I've taken three identical readings exactly the same code using different variables to capture the times but that's it so pulse set 1, pulse set 2 and then pulse set 3 is down below you can't see it but again it's identical code so that the timing will be as close as I can possibly get it every time uh, we'll go over pulse set 1 in detail, and 2 and 3 you can see that it's uh, the same. But, uh, okay, so I set the trigger to true. I go to sleep for 11 thousandths of a, or 10 microseconds, a little bit over 10 microseconds to trigger the pulse. 
and then I turn it off. So I send out the ping. Then I wait. And I capture the time while I'm waiting. So I want to know when the, the ping went out and then when the ping came back. And this is my this is my timing and I know the speed of sound, therefore I know the distance it went. We did all this in the other videos where we measured distance and we measured speed. Here I'm going to capture the wall time, if you will, the wall clock time, the real time. So these have to do with the ping and how fast the ping went out and back. And this is the total time that the object was falling until the measurement was taken. Pulse set to exactly the same thing except I'm using different variables to capture the times. And pulse set 3, again ditto. So this, the program just falls through these and it takes the readings as fast as possible. Capture the last time and then I print these that you see over here. I print this stuff over here. Uh, the pulse times and the delta, uh, delta times uh, between total time 1, total time 2, total time 2, and total time 3. So that's these over here, so I'm printing all that stuff out so we can see what's going on. I'm going to turn the ping off, just make sure it's off, uh, just to be neat and clean. And now I'm going to perform all the calculations. I did not want to perform the calculations in the loops because I didn't want to risk slowing things down or changing the timing. I wanted to have it as neat as possible. So, again, once again, these are all the same, 1, 2, and 3, the calculations are all the same. So the pulse width, which is the total time that it took for the ping, is the pulse end minus the pulse uh, start times, times a half, because we only want the one way. When you ping something, you have out and back, so we only want the out time, if you will. So we took half of that. Then we calculate the distance, we take that time times the speed of sound, so we get the distance. Uh, if, if it's out of range, that's what this, if distance 1 is uh, less than 2 or distance 1 is greater than 400, those are centimeters, then error equals true. So in other words, we, we had an erroneous reading and we give an error message and we don't, we don't uh, keep this data. We throw the whole, in fact, we throw the whole reading out. So. And then we calculate velocity, and velocity is the uh, change in distance over the change in time. Okay, that's fine. And as we remember, velocity 1 down here came out to be 0, so that was correct. Go on to pulse 2. Pulse 2 is exactly the same calculation with different variables. And we get the distance, and the distance is 48, similar to the distance of 1. So, yeah, it's accurate within the reading of the module and uh, okay distance and then velocity and the velocity on this one not so good but okay eight centimeters a second something like that man and then we calculate pulse width three and the distance and the distance is 48 eh, again not too bad uh, velocity we get a velocity of minus nine well okay you know plus or minus 10 centimeters a second, something like that. Yeah, okay. Uh, not too terrible for normal measurements. And then we're going to print, uh, well, these are the lines where I print these distances over here, so this is where those come from, right here. Print the distance and velocities. And then the last one are the accelerations, and I've used several different ways of calculating this. Uh, the way I got the most accurate is just to take the difference of the distances and the distance of the wall time squared. So this is based on the formula. Let me show you the formula. Distance equals one half at squared and I did a little bit of algebra on it to come up with acceleration equals two times the distance divided by the time squared. Uh, assuming I remember my algebra correctly. That's right. I tried this formula which is just uh, delta uh, V, change in velocity over change in time, and I got a lot worse results. So my thinking is that the more I calculate, the less accurate my results get. So I'm losing stuff in the calculations, uh, probably rounding errors or whatever in Python. Okay, so these are the two things that you're going to see printed out down here, the acceleration of 2 and 3. Uh, come down here, my distance error, so I print the the 
if it's an error, I print the error message and I quit. Otherwise, I print the accelerations. And you can see over there, acceleration two, acceleration three. I just print the integers. And then I do the GPIO cleanup and I print done. And then I do a sysexit just to make everything nice and, and clean when I leave. So my guess is, my best guess is that these errors, these little errors that are in here, they're adding, multiplying, dividing as we go through the calculations and that the module is just too slow and it's not accurate enough and the timing is just not accurate enough to produce an acceleration. So I don't know, uh, I may be wrong again on this. Uh, if somebody out there can point out that, I'd love to see it. I spent days working on this trying to cut down every possible error in here, but it just uh, doesn't get any better than this. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's my uh, fail for the week. And I wish, uh, I wish I could do better, but uh, I just don't think the uh, module is fast enough, accurate enough. And the Pi, if I had a lot more processing time with the Pi, I could probably uh, get it done. So, what I'm looking forward to is a LiDAR, a laser module to, to measure distance and whatever. And with that, I'm pretty sure I could do acceleration. Okay, well, I hope you found it interesting and maybe a little bit educational in your Raspberry Pi experimentation.